Uh, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We'll be looking at verses 39 through 46 as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study here in Luke's gospel. We're going to be looking at Jesus in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, we'll read together here, beginning at verse 39. I'll read to verse 46, and we'll get into our study. Let's begin at verse 39, Luke chapter 22. We read to verse 46 and get into our study. Luke writes, coming out... He went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And so what we have here as we have the events that relate to what is called the agony in the garden. Jesus is on his way to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, even though Luke tells us here in verse 39 that he went to the Mount of Olives, all you need to do is cross-reference this with Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, and Matthew tells you the location. He's, the Mount of Olives is actually a range outside of uh, the eastern gate there in the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to a specific location that we know in Scripture as the Garden of Gethsemane. By now, uh, Judas has, has left the group in order that he might complete his betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's now probably close to midnight, and on this night he is completing his ministry with his disciples. He's ministered to them for a number of years, and, and he's completing his public ministry. He has given his last teachings to his disciples. We've seen some of that as we've gone through chapter 22 here and all, but we also see that when you especially look at John's gospel, chapter 13 through chapter 17, and Jesus has been giving them a very deep and profound uh, lesson that night, and he's also instituted what we call communion Union, and now he's on his way to this garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, it's called the Garden of Gethsemane because the word Gethsemane speaks of an oil press. And when you look at this Garden of Gethsemane, it's on the Mount of Olives, it tells you that they, that was a place where they would, they would press the uh, olive oil and all, and so it was simply called the Gethsemane, or its oil press, and, and it gives us an insight into what's about to take place. This Garden of Gethsemane was actually what would be called an estate. It was a garden, but rather we would more than likely call it an orchard. It was located across a brook that we'll be seeing later on as we study called the Brook Kedron. It's at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It's about three-quarters of a mile just outside of the eastern walls of the city of Jerusalem. We've been to this location many times. And as we've been there, we've had studies on this particular passage of Scripture. And this is where Jesus is about to agonize. He's about to agonize in prayer. That's why we refer to this as the agony in the garden. Now, there's a fine Bible teacher by the name of John MacArthur, and John MacArthur points something out concerning this, his agony there in the garden. And John MacArthur says, there's no record in Scripture of Jesus' laughing, but there are numerous accounts of his grieving, his sadness, and even his weeping. He wept at the grave of Lazarus and wept over Jerusalem at the time of his triumphal entry. Jesus knew sorrow upon sorrow and grief upon grief as no other man who has ever lived. But the sorrow he experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane on the last night before his crucifixion seemed to be the accumulation of all the sorrows he had ever known. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is going to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's in this garden that we can understand Isaiah's description of the Messiah, you see, in Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah being written over seven centuries before Christ, in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 and 4, he begins to describe the Messiah. And he says there that he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. When it says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that word acquainted means to know something by experience. And the Lord Jesus Christ is one who's acquainted or knows by experience what grief really is. And we're going to see that in just a moment. But one of the things about that knowledge is that because the Lord Jesus Christ is acquainted with grief, that's one of the reasons why I feel so comfortable taking my sorrows to him. Because being a man of sorrows, being acquainted with grief, tells me that he understands my limitations, he understands my problems, he understands the pains that I go through from the perspective of the fact that he is acquainted in a personal way with those kinds of things. Not that he ever failed, of course he never did. But Jesus understands grief, and we're going to see that in some degree in just a moment. But anyway, as we look at this, in verse 39, it makes it very clear that he comes out and he goes to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also follow him. This is a place that his disciples knew very well because he came to this area often. Judas would know about this, and that, that's how he would be aware of his whereabouts, and that would explain to us how that Judas is about to bring the officers to this particular place to arrest him. Jesus, Jesus came here often, so Judas was familiar with it. When we get to that point where, where he's betrayed and, and Judas enters in, we'll cross-reference that with John 18, but let me read it to you right now. In John 18, verses 1 and 2, it says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples across the Kedron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas who betrayed him knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. And so Jesus had a practice of going to the Garden of Gethsemane. He did that often and Judas ultimately knew exactly where Jesus was. That's how he came with the officers in order to arrest him. Now as they enter in and what I'm doing here is cross-referencing this. I'm going to cross-reference this with Matthew as well as make an, uh, a mention of Mark, Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14. But as they enter in, Matthew tells us something in chapter 26 of Matthew's gospel, verse 36. He writes, as they enter the garden, Jesus says, sit here while I get, go and pray over there. And so what happens is Jesus enters into the garden, and at the entrance, he actually stations eight of his disciples. Eight of the disciples remain there at the entrance to the garden. And that is going to provide him with some privacy. But he speaks to them and he says to them that they are to be seated and they're to pray. They're to be seated there while he goes and he prays. And so they are to be seated there, but they're also to be in prayer there for himself. Because Luke twenty two forty 40 tells us that he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. So he speaks to them and he says to them that they're to be there. He's going to go off to pray, but they ought to be praying too. Now, Jesus has been speaking to them and teaching them. Remember the context. And he's been telling them that he's about to be put to death. Matthew 26, verse 2 says that Jesus said, After two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now, he had just stated to them that they would forsake him. He even went so far as to say they would deny him. So they know they're in a time of crisis. But at this point, they're trusting in their own strength. And so what he's doing is he's exhorting them to pray that they might not enter into temptation. He leaves eight of them at the entrance of the garden, and he takes with them three further on and further in. Matthew 26, 37 tells us who these were that he took with him. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. The two sons of Zebedee are James and John. And so what he does is he leaves eight stationed at the entrance and takes with him three further on into the garden. Now, these, these people that we see, Peter, James, and John, are actually what is some have, some have re referred to as his inner circle of disciples. Jesus had numerous, numerous followers, and when you look at the multitudes, you can actually break it down just by looking at the various passages that relate to the numbers of people that followed him. So Jesus had numerous followers, disciples. But out of the numerous of the multitudes, you see that Luke refers to 70. You see that it's broken down further to 12. And then it's broken down further from the 12 to actually four. And then you have three because you have his inner circle. So from the multitudes, you have the 70, you have the 12, it breaks down to the four, and then you have the three. 
And so, for example, we have his inner circle with him when he is raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. You have Peter, James, and John there. That's recorded in Mark 5, 37. You have Peter, James, and John at the Mount of Transfiguration. You find that in Mark 9, verse 2. And then in Mark chapter 13, verse 3, at the Olivet Discourse, we know that Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him a question privately. And so you have a multitude, you have 70, you have 12, you have four, you have here the three. These are what are called the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. And he's about to teach them a lesson. And this lesson that he's about to teach them is something that they're to communicate later. And the lesson is this, how do you face strong pressures? Every one of us in this room who's a believer needs to answer this question for ourselves. If somebody were to ask you, how do you face your toughest times? How do you deal with strong pressure in your life? Jesus has given us the answer here, and he tells us how to do that. The way that we deal with pressure is we have to have something built within us that enables us to withstand it, and that comes through prayer and that comes to relying on the Lord. It comes through dependence on God, and you're going to see this in just a moment. And so as this is taking place, again in verse 40, he came to the place, and he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And so, verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will... Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So, he's now withdrawn about 30 to 50 yards. A stone's throw is 30 to 50 yards. And this distance of 30 to 50 yards going further on in is intended to separate him from the other eight disciples. And in this place here, we see the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this agony is unequaled. He is deeply troubled, and emotional heaviness is weighing on him. If you take notes, you might want to note Mark chapter 14. I'm going to look at this for a moment with you. Mark 14, verse 33 and 34, because in that passage, Mark says this. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be troubled and to be deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Stay here and watch. Deeply distressed. My soul is troubled. That means it is in great distress or anguish. It's the strongest of three Greek words in the New Testament for our word depression. Jesus is going through a stress and an agony that is beyond anything that any of us could understand. He's going through the strongest sense of sorrow that a human being could ever go through. And the question has to be asked, what would cause him to be going through such a struggle, an internal distress? Well, when you begin to think about what's taking place, it makes sense to me, at least. Judas had betrayed him. The apostle Peter would soon deny him three times. His disciples would soon forsake him. He was about to be unjustly accused and tried. He would be beaten. He would be cursed. He would be mocked. Ultimately, he'll bear the sin of the world by being crucified. He's about to take death upon himself. And as the Lord is there in this garden agonizing and suffering, he's going through something that no human being could understand. None of us in this room have gone through anything quite like that. Most of us have experienced what it means to be forsaken. Many of us have had close friends who have betrayed us. But none of us have carried the weight of the world upon our shoulders, and Jesus did. And he's there in agony, and his agony is unequaled. He's going to become a sin offering. He's taken upon himself the world's sin. And as he does that, He's actually going to be overcoming death. It's been said he disarmed death by burying its shaft in his own heart. And as the Lord Jesus Christ is there praying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He's there, he's there agonizing in prayer. Now, Jesus had gone a stone's throw away, 
And as he's there with his disciples, he's actually left Peter, James, and John as he's moved even further on by himself. And as he's there a little further on, Jesus is, is, is in prayer now. And, and notice what he says. He says, if it's your will, take this cup from me. So the agony of becoming the sin offering moves him to ask if there's another way. Is there any other way? I remember on one occasion many years ago now we were in, in Israel and we were in the site called the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, Pastor Chuck Smith was there and we, were, we had joined him in one of his tours. And, and I can remember as, as we were there in this particular area and the Lord Jesus Christ, in the area that the Lord Jesus Christ had been, had been in prayer in, I remember my pastor as he was giving a Bible study in this passage here. And, and I remember the, um, the passion of Pastor Chuck's voice as he was speaking and as he was saying that the Lord Jesus Christ said if there was another way. And then Chuck says to us, and I'll never forget, it's a very simple thing, but it ministered to me, it reminded me of so much. He said, but there is no other way. There was no other way. There, there, if there were another way, then it would have been provided, but there simply was no other way. If there was another way for this to take place, if there was another way for salvation to occur, if there was another way for us to have a right relationship with God, then, then, then Jesus would have died in vain. You know, Paul said that he doesn't frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness could come through the law, Christ died in vain. If there was a way for us to have a relationship with God outside of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, if there was a way for me to have a relationship with God outside of Jesus taking upon himself human flesh, dwelling amongst men, and ultimately yielding his life up as a ransom, atonement, a sacrifice for redemption, if there were any other way, it would have been made possible, but there was no other way. And that's the heart of Christianity, you see. That's what makes us different than the other so-called faiths in the world because our, our faith teaches us, it, it, it informs us that God loved the world so much that he actually did something about its lost condition. He didn't leave us in the situations that we found ourselves in. He didn't leave us in that way. He rescued us. He sent his son Jesus Christ to take upon himself human flesh in order that he might go through the things that human beings do. He was tempted in every way as a man and yet he knew no sin. Jesus never succumbed to it. On one occasion, he spoke concerning Satan, and he said, he has nothing within me. There's nothing inside of me that responds to anything that he has to offer. Jesus Christ came as the, as the second Adam in order that he might give to us life by demonstrating that he could perfectly fulfill the will of his Father. And in doing so, he provided for us salvation because God's justice and God's righteous standards require perfection and a perfect offering. And yet, none of us is capable of giving that to God. Not a single human being has ever lived on the face of the earth outside of Jesus Christ who is without sin. Jesus is the only one who could do that. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the only one who could live a perfect life. He's the only one who could look at people, including his mother and his brothers and all who knew him, and he can say, which of you can convict me of sin? And not a single one could. Now, if I stood up and I said, which of you can convict me of sin? The, the, the line would go out the door. Marie would be the first person in line, and you'd never even get a chance to talk. <laughs> Bottom line, we know that. Every one of us know that if we're honest with ourselves. That not a single one of us has the ability to say we haven't sinned. There's not a, certain, not a person on earth, not a single one who can say I have not sinned. All of us have sinned in word, thought, or deed. And we do so every day. And we need help. We, we need help from God. And, and God said, I know that. That's why I sent my son to die on the cross for you. There was no other way. There was no other way. God's requirements were perfection. God gave the law for a multitude of reasons, including the fact that it's a schoolmaster intended to bring us into faith in Christ. The law of God, Paul tells us in the book of Romans, is intended to help us to put a finger on the things that are wrong with us. It, it actually defines our lives for us. I didn't know what sin was, Paul said, until the Scriptures said, Thou shalt not covet, and then it awakened in me all manner of covetousness. In other words, I became aware of what covetousness is, through the law that says you shouldn't have it. He said, and that awakened in me the reality that I'm a wretched sinner in need of help. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, the Apostle Paul asks. Thanks be to God who gives us a victory in Jesus Christ. And so the bottom line is, is the, that, that Jesus Christ came in order that I might have life through him. 
He took upon himself human flesh and agonized for me in that garden as he was praying and as he was seeking his father and, and all that was taking place. He wasn't, he wasn't agonizing simply on his own behalf. It was, a, it was a, a time of agony in which he's going through the sense of the fact that he's about to yield up his life and all, but he was doing that with a purpose and that purpose was redemption. It was for us. It was so that we might have a relationship with God. In Mark 14, 36, Mark says, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now, when you read that, Mark 14, 36, and you see the word Abba, that word is a very tender word. It's the word that babies learn when they're speaking to their daddy. It's, it's a word that means daddy. It's a tender word. I've been in Israel so many times, and, and there have been many times when I've seen the little Jewish child next to the daddy, and I've heard that little baby speaking to daddy, and he still says it, Abba, Abba. It means daddy. And that's how Jesus is speaking to his father. It, it's not one of these rigid kinds of relationships at all. He's saying, Daddy, all things are possible to you. But he says, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. There is no other way. And it's not going to be according to what I would desire because I've come submitted to do your will. In the volum volume of the book, it is written concerning me, I have come to do thy will, O God. The writer of Hebrews reminds us. And so that's what Jesus did. He came that he might lay his life down for us, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When he speaks concerning this cup, when he says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me, that cup is a picture. It's a picture of the wrath of God. The cup is a picture of God's judgment. The cup symbolizes the suffering that Jesus will endure on the cross. It pictures God's wrath, his displeasure towards sin. Some theologians have taught that we should not ascribe to God such a human emotion as wrath. I used to teach Bible studies in Montclair High School. I was an assistant pastor back in 1979, ancient history for some of you. And I would go to Montclair High School and teach uh, their Christian club. And I can still remember as I was teaching there in Montclair High School and sharing something out of Scripture that spoke of the wrath of God, and I remember bringing it up. One of the high school students approached me and said to me, my pastor says there's no such thing as wrath, that God has no wrath towards us. And I said, that's where you're wrong. And that's where, you know, I'm sorry to say, but your pastor is wrong also because the Word of God speaks specifically concerning God having wrath. Wrath is defined as a settled anger, and God's wrath is a settled anger towards sin. The psalmist in Psalm 75, verse 8, says, "...in the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs." Isaiah 51, verse 17 reads, Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained it to its dregs, the goblet that makes men stagger. It's a picture of God's settled displeasure towards sin. And when Jesus is saying, take this cup from me, it's a picture of God's wrath towards sin, and he doesn't want to be drinking that. In other words, he doesn't want to be taking, partaking of it because of God's wrath and all, and he doesn't desire to have that experience. John the Baptist gives us insight concerning what is called the wrath of God. If you take notes, it's found in John 3, 36, and this is what he says. He says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He who believes the Son. Interestingly, you know, John the Baptist doesn't say, uh, if you want to have eternal life, you need to do good deeds. 
You need to do some religious activity. We need to remember the context of his ministry. He came and he spoke to the religious people of his day. He even referred to them as being hypocrites and all because these were individuals who were able to, to establish rules and regulations, but they were not those who followed them themselves. And John the Baptist, when he came, was calling people and saying to them, including the religious individuals, that they needed to get right with God. He didn't say, continue doing the religious things that you're doing. When he was speaking, he said, you need to believe. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to have faith in God through him. You need to believe in him. And if you believe in the Son, you have, present tense, everlasting life. You see, you can be passed from death unto life through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not trying to work hard. It's not trying to keep religious precepts. It's not trying to go to church every Sunday and when the doors are open, you show up and that's going to earn you brownie points with God. He doesn't grade on the curve. What he's looking for is he looks for somebody who trusts him and believes in him and has faith in him and relies on him. You in my, uh, in my um, emails, I get a lot of emails from members of our fellowship and, and others who, who write me and all. And one of the more common things that I, that I deal with, one of the most common questions I get is related to, if I'm not good enough, am I going to not enter into heaven? I get that so many, in various, very, various forms and variations. But I'm afraid that if, I, if I'm not good enough, I'm going to go to hell. And, and I am constantly saying the same thing to them. And it isn't based on works of righteousness which you've done. It, it, it's based on what he's done. And what he has done is he has died on the cross for you. Have you trusted him? Is he your savior? If you were standing before God in judgment and, and God were to ask a question like, why should I allow you into my kingdom? Why should I allow you into heaven? What would your answer be? Would it be because I tried hard? W would it be because I was baptized? W would it be because I served in church? W would it be I taught Sunday school? I was kind to people? I hardly kicked my dog and, no, I mean, what would it be? What would it be? You see, the bottom line is a lot of people, even to this day, think that they have to say that I did some good thing. The answer that you give to enter into the kingdom of heaven is, is, is a simpler answer than that. The answer is, I believed you. I trusted you. I put my faith in you. I relied on you. I had full confidence in you. I rested completely upon you. I believed in you. That's what John is saying. And I was born again. That's what John is saying when he says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he also went on to say, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, his settled displeasure rests on him, abides on him. So to believe in Jesus is to live. To disregard him is to suffer the consequences. John said the wrath of God continually abides on those who reject him. You see, the Lord does not hold a person guiltless if they have received Christ. He will give them eternal life, but if they reject him, he will not leave them guiltless because they have rejected him. In Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, Paul asks this question. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. And so, there's a way to escape wrath. There's a way to escape the God of wrath, and that is to come to the Son. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ came to do, guys, is to give us a way of escape, to give us a way of relationship with him. And so here in verse 42, when he says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The fact is, there was no other way. 
When he says, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done, he was simply saying, I am totally submitted to your plan of redemption. God the Father had determined that salvation would occur through the death of his son. Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. Why don't you turn there with me for just a moment? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to show you this in Scripture. And some are new at turning your Bibles places and you're saying to yourself, where is 2 Corinthians? Let me help you. It's right after 1 Corinthians. There you go. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. In Second Corinthians 5, 19 through 21, Paul writes, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God in the Word is portrayed as being at war with man. Man is at war with God, and God is resisting man. But God is the victor. God is the conqueror in Scripture. He is presented to us. And God has given to man terms of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a doctrine that speaks of the cessation of hostile activities. And so what God has done is God has become victor. He is victor. And Jesus is now the one who has made victory possible through the death on the cross. God has defeated death. God has defeated the devil. And God has given to us a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus dies on the cross for us, he disarms death, he leads captivity captive, and we as believers now embracing him have entrance into the kingdom of God. Now that we have a relationship with God, we have become ambassadors. An ambassador is a person who represents their home country. And so what we are is we are citizens of heaven representing heaven to the world. And God has given to us a message, the messages of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. So what we do is we as ambassadors take the message of reconciliation. Now, in the message of re reconciliation, God has given to them a treaty. But what the treaty is, he's simply saying that the hostility will cease when you fully surrender. It is not a conditional surrender. There are times that you can have hostilities with another country and you have a cessation of hostility, but you have conditions or terms of surrender, or you have just a cessation with no surrender whatsoever. What you have in, in the Bible is a picture not of a conditional, but an unconditional surrender. God is saying, I am victorious, you have lost, these are the terms or conditions of you having relationship with me and entrance into my kingdom that those terms come through what is called the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. You can have a relationship with God. And so what, it, what God has done is God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be a sin offering for us that we might become those who have the righteousness of God in him. Because I need to have righteousness to enter into the kingdom of God. I need to put faith in Jesus who imparts to me and imputes to me what is called his righteousness. And so when you got saved, your righteousness, Isaiah describes it as being as filthy rags, your righteousness being something not worthy of the kingdom of God is now released from you and you are now imputed the righteousness of Christ. So you stand before God with his robe of righteousness on you, and that's how you can enter into the kingdom of God. And so, if God says to you, why should I allow you into the kingdom of heaven, you will not say, because I tried hard, or I was religious, I served, or I gave. You will say, because I believed in the Son, Jesus Christ, who imparted to me his righteousness, giving to me access to heaven. And that all came because Jesus Christ went to the cross. 
And so there he is in the garden. As you turn on back to Luke chapter 22, there he is in the garden. And there he is speaking to his father, and he's submitting to the will of the father. Now, as this is going on, Luke chapter 22, verse 43, Luke says, an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. So God provides the answer to his son's prayer by sending the angel to strengthen him, to enable him to continue doing that which is necessary. And that's normally how it works, by the way, even in your life when you say, God, give me help. He doesn't necessarily extricate you from the thing that he's allowed you to enter into. He simply gives you strength to endure so that his work can be done in you. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. He said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Notice verse 45, how it says that he found them sleeping. Sleep sometimes is a means of escape. Some of you know that very well. You go through such agony and so great concern that you actually escape your concern by going to sleep. These are people who are confused and these are people who are depressed. But as Jesus comes to them in verse 46, he asks them the question, why are you sleeping? And then he says, rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Watch and pray. Spiritual vigilance is not occasional. Spiritual vigilance is constant. He's letting them know you are about to be tried terribly. Now, in Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can anybody say amen to that? We understand that, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Lord, I want to do the right thing, but it's so much easier to do the wrong thing. I had a friend of mine, his name was Gus. And Gus told me one day, when I was on, on the job with him, and Gus told me one day, well, you, you're a Christian. You took the easy way out. And I said, man, that's where you're wrong. I didn't take the easy way out at all. When I be, became a Christian, that's not the easy way out. It's easier when I'm depressed to get drunk. That's the easy way out. It's easier when I don't have any money to find something to steal. That's the easy way out. It's easier for me when I was a, a, a young man and, and, and going out with a girl, it's easier for me to, to attempt to get her to get into bed with me than to die to the desire for sex. I have to tell you, it's not the easy way out at all. And I told him, listen, walking with the Lord isn't the easy way out at all. You don't understand what you're saying. It's a way of death. It's, it's a way of discipline. It's an entirely different way of life because it's easier for me to get angry that person to that, at that person who's cut me off or has done something rude to me or whatever. It's a lot easier, especially when I was younger. It was a lot easier to get in the flesh than it was to hold back. A lot easier, a lot easier just to let go because my flesh is there. And so the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's no doubt about it. How do you overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. Jesus says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Listen. This could help some in this room right now. Next time you are tempted to get drunk, listen, Thanksgiving's tomorrow. It can happen tomorrow, can't it? It can, can't it? You know it can. You can say amen to that, yes. It can happen. You go to your family's house, they say we ought to have just a little toast, and, you know, one's not bad. We ought to have a second toast. Mm, two's not bad, I feel okay. So when you begin to toast, you get what we used to call toasted. You get high. <laughs> After a while, you're going, oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, let me tell you something. This will help you. Next time you fall into the place where you're saying, boy, this is tempting, ask Jesus, Jesus, do you mind if I get drunk? 
If he says, right on, give me some too, then drink. Next time, next time you find yourself in a position where a lie is a lot easier to, 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 to give than the truth, ask the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, do you mind if I lie to get out of this? It's a little lie. It's not a big lie. It's a small lie. Do you mind if I get out of this lie? A lie is easier than the truth. If Jesus says, go ahead, lie your head off, then lie. Next time you get tempted to have a relationship sexually with somebody other than your wife, or if you're not married, you want to fornicate, next time you get in that position, say to Jesus, Lord, do you mind if I fornicate? And if he says, go for it, do you have his permission? But you know, and I know, that he would say, don't drink. You know that he'd say, don't lie. And you know that he would say, don't fornicate. You know that. He's already told you that. He's already given you the word concerning that, hasn't he? This isn't new. This isn't brand new. He gave you that. You know how to overcome it? And I'm telling you, this is true. It, 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 it is true. Pray. Pray. Watch. When he says watch and pray, the word watch there is a military term. It, it, it's, it's what we did when I was in the military when we stood watch. We were on the alert. We were aware. The enemy can come in. You're on watch. You have guard duty. That's what the word speaks of, watch. Now, why would he say watch? He would say watch because you're in a war and the enemy is trying to find a way into your camp. So stay awake. Be alert because he's going to find the weakness in your life. He will find the vulnerability and he will take you. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And undoubtedly, he has marked your life because if you are following Jesus, then you have now become the difficult target. I've told you this before, again, a military thought. When I was in basic training and our, um, our, uh, our sergeant told us, you've got three targets, 300 meters, 150 meters, 75 meters, which one do you take out first? When I was going through basic, one of the guys raised his hand. I never answered questions that the sergeant ever asked, by the way. I just <laughs> let somebody else look foolish. Some guy raises his hand. I take out the 75-meter target. And the sergeant says, that's where you're wrong. You take out the harder target, and you work your way down to the easier one. Take out the harder one, and work your way down to the easier one. Always take out the harder target. Listen, if you're backslidden, are you a hard target or an easy target? You're an easy target. He doesn't even have a concern for you. You're already doing great damage to the cause of Christ without his help. But when you're walking with the Lord, when your life is solid, you now are in his sights. He's now looking at you. So some people say, how come when I'm trying to walk with the Lord and do so well and I want to serve God, how come things begin to work against them? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> You've become a hard target. He's going to take you out. Some people think that Satan's like a kitten. He's a roaring lion. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. He will demolish you and your family. He will take you out. And he will do that because he hates you. And when you set your sights on heaven, and when you start getting serious with God, I promise you conflict. I promise you heartache. I promise you conflict because that's what's going to happen. And Jesus said, watch. And Jesus said, pray. Be alert because the minute you start saying, Lord, it's for you, all for you, I'm going to serve you, then everything around you starts to erupt. And so many people give up the moment some problems occur. It amazes me. Watch and pray. Because watching and praying safeguards your walk. And pray, Lord, I'm going to go out with this young lady, and you know that my feelings for her have gone beyond friendship. In Jesus' name, Lord, 
I don't want to fall. I don't want to enter into something that is displeasing to you, and I don't want to ruin her relationship with you. I don't want to be in God in Jesus' name. Help me have the wisdom not to put myself in a position where I'm going to find myself in a compromise and ultimately be speaking to you later on, begging for your forgiveness. God in Jesus' name, help me to have the wisdom not to spend a lot of quiet time with her alone in her house when nobody is around. Again, duh. Help me, Lord. Jesus, I want my friends to get saved. They're inviting me to go to a bar. You know that I used to have problems with alcohol and everything, but I want them to get saved. Help me when I go into the bar. No, God, I will meet them at a coffee shop. I'll have coffee with them later on. Because, Lord, I know if I walk into that area, I am going to succumb to the temptation. So, Jesus, in your name, God, I'm going to, I'm going to avoid this. Been there, done that. I don't like the guilt that I feel. So, Lord, help me. That's how it happened. That's how it's happened in my life, up front. I failed, and I would wake up miserable, and I would weep, and I'd say, God, I don't want to do that again. And then I discovered, you sure pray a lot after you fail. Why didn't you start praying before you fail? Makes sense to me. Lord, I'm about to fornicate. Okay? No. It's a sin. So don't. I'm telling you, and Jesus is teaching us a principle of survival. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. You know, the sad thing about all of this is Matthew records that Jesus went and he prayed again, and he actually comes upon them in total three times. Three times they fell asleep, and three times Jesus came to wake them up. And what happened is they yielded to their natural appetites, and in doing so, became spiritually unprepared. Now, Jesus, after his season of prayer, was ready to meet the enemy head on. We'll see this next time we're together. But as we will see, his disciples were not. Jesus was, but his disciples were not. Jesus took his, his petitions to the Father. His disciples did not. Jesus met the enemy head on. His disciples were overcome. I want to learn from Jesus and from the disciples because I want to watch and pray that I enter not into temptation.